Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, the Broth and License Commission, along with many agencies that help local restaurants, uh, package stores, um, dealers, many other things that we oversee on the License Commission, are here to really help you know, owners, business owners, residents, um, and this is, this, this is not a punishment, you know, this is to help. So please take the information, um, process it. Um, so a little bit about how the commission works. So we are a board of five, um, a quorum of three. You need two affirmative votes in order for something to pass. Um, we hear many different applications in the city. Today in attendance today with me is John McGarry, Commissioner and Robert Simpson and Paul Stadinsky is in the back and our, uh, our attorney is in the back as well. Um, I'm going to just do some quick formal introductions of, we have the ABCC from Boston here, we have Deputy Chief Fire, um, Eddie Williams, we have Lieutenant Paul Benanka, um, Superintendent of Buildings um, of Jim, James Plouffe, um, we have I believe I've seen Mondesir here from the health department, and we have all you folks. So I just want to really thank you for uh, uh, being here with us today. Um, you guys have anything to say? So we won't take any more of your time, and we'll get the ball rolling. If you do have any questions um, or concerns, you can reach out to these departments directly. We are a staff of one, so Sylvia is our only employee, so sometimes responses are not, um, are not prompt, but she is a hard worker and we love her. Thank you. Yes. You want to use? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ralph Sacrimony. I'm the executive director with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Alcoholic Beverage and Control Commission. And we'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending here today. And one thing I want everybody to remember, and just as the chairman of the Brockton Board has just said, is that this is here for you. All right, we have all these agents here to help you to continue to move through your businesses. We know that it's been a rough two years with COVID and we want to get everybody on the same track. We want you to stay in compliance. That is the biggest thing you're gonna learn about today. We're gonna give you all the tools to stay in compliance. All right, just not with the ABC, with the police department, with the fire department, with uh, the building department. All, everyone that is here today is here to assist you. Before uh, we move forward with the agenda, I'd just like to introduce the chairman of the ABC just to do a greeting. The chairman I'd like to introduce is Jean Larizio. Thank you, Ralph. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. I know it was a tough morning to get out. Um, as Ralph said, um, this, this is this, we come out today to try to help you, to give you information to help you. As I know you're all aware, the ABCC is a regulatory agency, so we are charged with enforcing the laws of the Commonwealth and the rules of the ABCC. But another major focus of ours is education. So we are thrilled to be here today with all of these other agencies. And I do want to thank, in particular, Sylvia and the Brockton Licensing Board for hosting us today and helping us put this together. And um, hopefully we're going to provide you with a lot of information that will be helpful and will ensure that you are successful in your business and, and don't encounter any issues. So with that, I will turn it back over to Ralph. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for coming, everyone. I'm sure everybody knows me. They really hate to see me walk through the doors, but that happens. I'm all about safety. My big thing is about safety. We have to make sure people are safe when they're in your establishments. This area has a bad history of nightclub fires and um, things like that. We go back to, was it 1942, the Coconut Grove in Boston. Many people died. And then um, we have the Rhode Island nightclub fire, which was a disaster. And I, I think that one really, hits home because it was videotaped. You could watch the whole thing. You watched the people die in the front door as they were trying to get out. And no one thought the night that they went in there that they were gonna die in that fire. 
but we, you could see them. And if you haven't watched the video, Google it. It's um, very impressive. The people trying to get out got caught and they just stacked up like firewood and that's where they died. And it should have never happened. There were a lot of mistakes being made down there. Uh, I'm very strict in what I do. Uh, if you ever have a chance to read a book called The Killer Show, it's written by a lawyer in Rhode Island. He is the lawyer that sued everybody and their uncle for that Rhode Island nightclub fire. And he got millions upon millions, I think it was over $100 million he got from people, including the city down there, um, and without going to court. They, they filed suit, but everybody just took out their wallet and paid because they knew they were going to be found guilty. So everybody can get into a mess, and I don't want myself or the city of Brockton or you guys to get into a, a bunch of uh, problems for a nightclub safety. So I've passed out some documents. Hopefully you picked them up as you came in. Um, there's a brochure, fire safety in places of assembly. If you have over 50 people in your establishment, you're a place of assembly. But even if you only have 25 and you serve liquor, you should try to go by the same rules. So read that. If you have any questions, my card's on the front table. One of my other inspectors is here that can answer questions for you. After the Rhode Island nightclub fire, um, I sat on a board and we made a regulation for crowd managers. Now, not everybody needs to have a crowd manager. There's, I think, seven or eight people in the city that have to have crowd management but it requires record keeping and paperwork. But it wouldn't hurt for everybody in this room to go home tonight, it's free of charge, spend an hour in front of the computer and take the crowd management course. I think you'll learn a lot from it. If you're a restaurant or a bar that serves liquor, you need to have a certificate of inspection. The certificate of inspection is co-signed by the building commissioner and the fire chief. And the important thing you need to see on this is the first red circle, that's the expiration date. I can tell you right now that there's people in this room that don't have their current certificate. They have expired certificates laying on their wall, and that shouldn't be. You need this to renew your, your um, liquor license, and it, it's possible that you shouldn't have your liquor license if you have an expired certificate of inspection. We come out, the fire department's proactive about coming out and doing the inspection, and we get it done before you, uh, your certificate expires. So when you go back to your establishment today, take a look at the certificate on the wall and see if it's current. If not, let's work on that. The second thing you need to notice is uh, the total number of occupants. In this particular establishment, it was 135 people. That 135 people includes patrons, employees, bartenders, cooks, dishwashers, anybody in the building. That's the number for the whole establishment, just not the crowd. And I can tell you right now, there's a couple of people in this room that have exceeded their limits. Um, one was just before COVID and we kind of just made it go away because COVID kind of changed the rules a little bit for a while. But you've got to make sure you don't become overcrowded. If you become overcrowded, there's harsh fines and criminal charges that can be brought against you. On the back of this form is the application for the building department. When you get close to expiring, if you're expiring, say, um, November 1st, October 1st, call the building department and make an appointment with the inspector that does the certificate of inspection inspections. His name's Inspector George DePina. He'll come out, he'll do the inspection, pass or fail, and then he'll have you fill this out, he'll sign off on it, you take it with a check, bring it to the building department, and that will start the process of getting the new certificate. Once they get your application, they fill it out, they send it to the fire department, the fire chief has to sign off on it, and then it's returned back to the building department and you can pick it up. We have a lot of people that wait till the last minute and come December 31st, they're running around trying to find us to sign their certificate because their liquor license isn't gonna be any good the next day. Don't wait till the end. We've, got it, we've kinda got the system designed to make it all happen ahead of time, but we need your cooperation to do that. So go back, this is one of the most important things you can take from here today is 
Go back and look at that expiration date and make sure your certificate stays current, the one that's on the wall. We'd appreciate that. When the fire department comes in to do their inspection, they look at a few things. We, we passed out our certificate of inspection checklist so that you can have a copy of it, you know what we're looking for. We want your street address on the front of the building. So if you're off 59 Main Street, we want a big 5-9. So if we, we probably know where it is, but we have out-of-town apparatus coming to the city all the time. They need to be able to find your establishment. The police need to be able to find your establishment uh, if there's an emergency. You, you're required to have an occupant load posted on your wall somewhere. Little sign that says occupant load, 47 people. We don't want to have to come in and look at this when we come in. We want to just see a sign that says occupant load and how many people. Um, we, if you have a crowd manager, you need to keep records. They need to be original documents every day that you start. I recently did an inspection and they were just mimeographing them and just putting them in a book every day. That doesn't, um, that doesn't work for us. And now that I said mimeograph, I'm really showing my age, I think. Um, we verify that the crowd manager that's on site is um, current. The crowd manager certificate is good for three years, but it's free, so everybody should have no problem getting it. We want to make sure that your door, where you see the red signs that say exit sign, those doors have to be clear. You can't have a table in front of it. You shouldn't have shelves with paper towel next to it. It needs to be free and clear so that people can get out in the case of an emergency. They have to work. I recently went to one establishment that I go to push the door and it doesn't push. And it's a very small amount of pressure. Is it 15 foot pounds, Jim? It, it's like 15 foot pounds. You're supposed to push and that door is supposed to open. If it doesn't, the door doesn't work. So you gotta make sure the doors actually work. And the path outside that door has to lead to the street. Not just to the parking lot, but to the street. So come February, when we get 22 inches of snow, you gotta make sure that the outside of that door and the pathway to the street is shoveled. There has to be um, continuous um, illumination to that pathway. That would either mean the regular lights are on, or the emergency lights are on if you lose power. You gotta make sure your um, emergency lights are working. Go up once a week, press the button to make sure they work. They operate on battery, most of them. So if you have a power failure in the middle of the night, they're gonna come on. But they don't always recharge. The batteries may be on their end of life cycle so that when um, you have a power failure at the middle of the night and you're not even there, they stop charging when you get back. So check them once a week if you can. Means of egress have to be properly marked. You're supposed to have an illuminated sign like the one to my right over the door, next to the door that says exit. Depending on how big your establishment is, you might have to have them throughout the building with arrows pointing to the means of egress. It's all about being able to find your way out. Um, during the Rhode Island nightclub disaster, people were actually denied access to by the security guards to the egress doors, and that's why everybody was trying to funnel out the front doors there. Uh, the, the doors that were at the front of that building were double doors. Most places, especially the newer places, have to have a double door at the front of the building. It's supposed to be at least 72 inches wide. Your occupancy is calculated on your door width. That's one of the components of calculating your occupancy level. I recently went to a restaurant for lunch yesterday, and I walked in the door and kind of take a double take. I'm walking through a single door. It used to be a double door. When it opened, it was a double door. But at some point, since they got their license and had an inspection, they reduced down to a single door and we have to fix that. They have to go back to having a double door. Commercial cooking equipment, that's one of the things that will um, start fires in restaurants. I've been in a restaurant where they've had a grease fire in the inside and we had to evacuate. Actually, I went into the kitchen, but everybody else evacuated. The, the hood systems have to be cleaned, either on a three, or it could be monthly, depending on who you are. It could be a three month, could be a six month thing, um, cycle. You have to have an in, a licensed inspector come in and they have to do a good job. A lot of the licensed people don't do good jobs and we have to go after them and take their licenses away. 
we have two cases going right now where we're going after inspectors. But make sure you're getting what you're paying for. Make sure they're just not wiping the outside. Make sure they're wiping the inside of it. Make sure they're doing an inspection. They're supposed to leave you a piece of paper saying what happened, and then they're supposed to put a sticker on your hood. Make sure those are all in order. Sprinkler systems. If you have sprinklers, you've got to make sure that they're inspected on a yearly basis. When we come to do our inspections, we're going to look for those sprinkler systems to be um, current and inspected. And the same with your fire alarms. Fire alarms have to be inspected on a yearly basis. We make sure that you have paperwork that says you do. If, we, if you don't pass our inspection, we don't sign off on your certificate of inspection. So by giving you all this information, we shouldn't have a problem when we walk into your places. Regular fire extinguishers, they should be within every 75 feet, usually by an exit, and they need to be inspected on a yearly basis by a fire extinguishing company. That's the one thing we don't have a lot of. Um, drapery, curtains, and other fabrics in a, a place of assembly, they have to meet a fire spec. You can't go down to um, Walmart today and buy curtains off the shelf. They're gonna, not going to meet the fire spec. There's a, a burning um, rate that has to be applied and it has to be tested. And you have to go to a commercial place to buy that that can supply you the records with what your, your furniture and drapery complies with. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had an establishment that they went down to Kmart and they hung these sheets from the windows. And I'm like, yeah, this doesn't work. Oh, they're fire retardant. All right, let's go outside. We went outside, I cut a little piece, I took a lighter to it, and it went up in flames in no time. So that's very, very important. Any material that you put on the wall needs to be fire retardant. If, you, uh, if you're a bigger place and you have bands and um, shows and things like that, you have to make announcements before the event that says the exits are, and you know what, I'm guilty today, I probably should have done it today myself, but the exits are in the back, there's an exit to my right here, that's how you get out of the building. You fit yourself into a nightclub atmosphere, people don't think about that, but you have to tell them about it so that they know in case something happens, it'll be in the back of their heads. Patio heaters, if you're gonna use patio heaters, um, there's some precautions to be taken. You need a propane permit for the storage of the propane. So if you're thinking about using patio heaters, call us. And if you have any questions, please feel free to call my office and talk to one of the inspectors. Um, but that's kind of what we look for in the um, inspection that we go through. The last document we'll leave you with from the fire department is our expectations for food and liquor establishments. Read it over. Uh, if you have any questions, call. We sent this out earlier this year. We're going to send it out again probably January or February. But Please, just don't get the envelope and throw it in the trash. Actually read it. It talks about exit signage, crowd managers, uh, rubbish handling, decorations, general housekeeping, fire lanes in your parking lot. Um, explains what a place of assembly is. It talks about the cooking equipment and how you can get it cleaned and inspected. It also talks about um, carbon dioxide issues in restaurants and carbon monoxide issues in restaurants. Carbon monoxide is caused by fossil fuel burning equipment. So your, your cooking line will create carbon monoxide. And if you've changed an appliance in the past 10 years, you probably have a carbon monoxide detector hooked up to your cooking line. So if your cooking line creates too much carbon monoxide, it shuts the gas down. Carbon dioxide is caused by the carbon dioxide you use to pump into the sodas and other drinks that you have. That can leak. Carbon dioxide takes the oxygen out of the air. There's been cases in Arizona where, in New York, people have gone into restaurants after being closed for 12 hours, walked in and dropped dead because the carbon dioxide took all the oxygen out. They walked in, they grabbed a bunch of carbon dioxide, they breathed it in, and they dropped dead. We're working on making it a requirement for all restaurants and anybody that uses the carbon dioxide in the buildings, and um, hopefully that may come out in the next year or so. It's not easy to pass a regulation at the state level. Uh, the other thing that um, we want to talk about is work being done in the restaurant. And this is more Jim's department, but we, we're the ones out there that we see it. If you do electrical work in the building, an it needs to be done by a licensed electrician, and he needs to have a permit, and it needs to be inspected. 
You just can't have a guy come in and change out some plugs or add a plug. That needs to be done. Same with plumbing work. Any plumbing work is supposed to be done under permit and inspected, and that's very, very important. It's there for safety. Gas fitting, if you decide to buy a new friolator and switch out the friolators, that requires a gas permit and inspection by the gas inspector before it's turned on. If you don't do it, you could run into problems. And we, being my inspectors, have gone out there and looked at the kitchen line and went, gee, that looked kind of new. And then we find out it was a new. We'll shut it down until you get that inspection because we're not going to leave any danger behind. The other thing um, that just came to mind was you have a kitchen hood and you have suppression on that kitchen hood. That suppression is supposed to be designed for the stove, the fry later, the grill, whatever's under it. If you change a piece of equipment, that has to be redesigned to meet the new piece of equipment. It's not universal. Every piece of equipment's different. Every design is different for the kitchen hood. So if you're gonna buy a new piece of equipment, make sure you get the fire suppression people in there behind the guy that installs the grill to fix it. And if you have a piece of equipment, equipment that creates grease-laden vapors, and that could be just a regular stove top, or that could be a grill, or it could be a fry later, it has to be under that hood. If it's not under that hood, we're gonna call foul and shut it down. We don't like to shut people down, but we do it for safety, and that, that's our big goal. Um, and, and building code work. If you put up a wall, change a door, build something, change the layout, they'll go over changing the layouts. But if you do something in there, you need a building permit, you need plans, you may need an architect to be involved, but you need that, and you, you need it before you do the work. Don't go in and do the work and then try to pull the permit because we're gonna call foul on that too. And we've run into that in a, two or three places recently. So it's very important that you gotta follow these rules. And it's all kind of outlined in this document. Um, I think that's all I have. Um, is there any questions? Not one. Okay, gets me off easy. I'll be here for the entire segment. Uh, Mr. Pluff will be here. He's going to leave at noon, but um, he'll be here. Eric Westland, who's one of my inspectors, is in the back of the room. He'll be here. Uh, feel free to ask us questions when you leave. You might not want to raise your hand and talk now, but feel free to come up and talk to us after. Thank you very much. And now I'll introduce. Uh, um, oh, sorry. Yes. Define cosmetic. Uh, You're going to paint the wall. You don't need a permit to paint. Flooring. flooring. Yes. Yes. Yep. Whispered in my ear, but yes, because your flooring has to meet a fire retardant. You can't go in and put shag carpet in and call it a, a floor because we have a problem with that. So any, anything you do, and you know what? If you if you're going to do something and you're not sure, call us. We'll talk to you and we'll, we'll, you know, give you a yes or no on it. We're, believe it or not, I am a friendly person. So, any other questions? No? Okay. I'd like to introduce um, Lieutenant Paul Benaka. He, he's the head of detectives for the Brockton Police Department, and he's the guy in charge of the license agents. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, uh, I'm the liaison to the License Commission as uh, part of the Police Department, and uh, to re reiterate what the uh, director of the APCC had uh, mentioned is that compliance is the most important thing. And uh, it's not about discipline. Uh, before something gets uh, sent to the License Commission, usually there are multiple warnings. So, and I think uh, that everybody can say that myself and the licensing agents have been very fair when it comes to uh, uh, any complaints and addressing any issues uh, in front of the License Commission. So uh, to reiterate also what uh, Deputy Fire Chief Williams uh, has mentioned, uh, I want to bring to everybody's attention, if you don't already know, that if you go on the City of Brockton website, specifically the License Commission, everyone will be able to see, and, and of course you need to have access to the internet, and if you, if you do or if you don't uh, have somebody maybe a family member that can assist you with internet access, but if you go on the License Commission website, as I'm doing on my phone right now, you can bring up the License Commission, you can scroll down. It'll give you basically instructions for uh, 
in applications for licenses, and also license rules for general on-premise alcohol and also for uh, restaurants and package stores. And this is accessible to everyone, so there really is no excuse to say, well, I didn't really know. You can actually go on the website, very important resource. You can look and you can uh, basically, it'll, it'll give you all the rules. That's from a local perspective. The ABCC, we, we mirror the ABCC, but we also have our own uh, rules that are, that are set by the License Commission. Now, I know that uh, Sylvia, the executive assistant, takes phone calls and she also uh, can give the, the, the rules and regs uh, when people ask, but she's inundated and uh, the, uh, the website is an absolute easy resource for everybody to, uh, to access. And uh, just to give an example, let's say I'm just scrolling down on this, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the website, for instance, uh, with restaurants, and I know we just had a question. For instance, I'm just reading one of the lines here, no, no physical renovations shall be made unless a plan is submitted and approved by the License Commission. Now that could be an answer to the question that uh, was just a, an audience member just asked. Again, if you go on the website and you scroll down from the License Commission, you'll see all those resources there. And there should be no confusion as to what the rules and regulations are. So um, I would suggest that everybody access that. And uh, myself and the license agents, if you need to speak with me, uh, I can be available at the Brockton Police Department. If you just call the, uh, the general business number, they can uh, transfer the call to me. and. I'll, uh, I can be available uh, at my extension, and or I can uh, call you back if you leave a message. So from the uh, the perspective of the police department, uh, with uh, our license agents, we're here to work with you, and uh, it's more about compliance, as the director of the APCC had mentioned. And that's uh, pretty much it. All right. Any questions? Well, uh, it, it doesn't. Uh, it, it can be a manual drawing, I believe. It doesn't have to be an, an architect's drawing, but um, according to the rules and regs, as, as you could see on the website, that all physical renovations, like the question I believe that you asked, it has to be submitted to the license commission beforehand. So that is is a fact, and, and you can actually see it in the uh, on the website. Any other questions? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, before we begin, does everybody have a copy of the agenda? This yellow sheet was handed at the door. Does anybody need one? Just raise your hand. We have extra ones. We get them passed out. Kyle, can you help me out? Just hold your hand up. We'll make sure you get copies of them. You need one? I think, every, I think everyone's all set. We're going to begin. As we've uh, been speaking about from the beginning of today's seminar, is this is here for you. It's about compliance. I'd like to thank the fire department, the building department, and the police department for taking their time that we all are liaison together to help you move forward. Now, if you look at today's agenda, and let me tell you how this came about. Years, the, the past practice for years was that the ABC would go and train the local licensing boards the local uh, administrative clerks, city solicitors. And we found that worked well. 
All right, but then we decided four years ago to start a new program is to take training right to the stakeholders, and that's everybody in this room. Licensees to say to them, look at these are the problems we're seeing, this is how you could correct them, and this is how you could prevent them. We started this four years ago with the city of Framingham, and the results have been excellent. Their violations have come down, their questions have gone up, and people are calling before they go and do a project in advance. It's better to ask than to go and do it, then have to take down the walls if, you're, if you didn't get it inspected, all right, or implementing an alteration of premises that's not been approved and you have an event going on that night. So all this is is compliance. So let's talk about uh, item A, all right. When working with local cities and towns, these are the five biggest issues we see uh, from licensees. And as you could see, we talk about ownership, People change ownership without getting uh, approval. The reason why a license is a privilege, it's not guaranteed, it's a privilege. In order for you to maintain that privilege, you must follow the rules. And this is what it's about. If you look at ownership, new officers and directors, if you are bringing in a new stockholder, they have to be vetted through the three-step application process. So you can just not bring in someone because there are statutory prohibitions for, for certain individuals that they can have ownership in a license. And it's very important, plus the law says under Chapter 138 is that a new investor, anyone with direct or indirect interest in license must be approved by the municipality, so it would be the city of Brockton and then by the ABC. So it's important that you remember that. Also changing officers and directors. All right. If you're bringing in, if your president resigns, you're bringing a new president. Clubs that have annual uh, elections every year for officers, directors, and so forth, you have to get permission because those people have a direct interest in how the alcohol is served, stored, and purchased. So it has to be approved. So those are the two biggest issues we see. How do you correct these? You go right to the website as. Uh, the lieutenant has said, right on our website, if you go to the local licensing board in Brockton, or if you go to the ABC website, you get to the homepage, your page is down, and asks you a question, what do you want to do? And everybody in this room is a retail licensee. So when you get to the website, there's two choices, apply for a state license or apply for a retail license. Y'all gonna click on retail license, and the next question is, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna apply for a new license? You want to transfer a license or do you want to amend your license? So what the amendment means, if you have already been issued a license and you want to change the manager, you want to change the offering director, you click on amendment and it gives you all choices of every transaction you can do. You fill it out online, you save it, you print it, you do your payment online and you bring all the information, the supporting documents to the Brockton board. That's who you would bring it to, Sylvia. At that point, she'll instruct you on what additional further information you need. With these transactions or these amendments is a checklist. We make it very simple for you to be compliant. You follow the checklist before you submit anything to Sylvia and it'll be a nice smooth process. It's when you skip over a step is what's gonna inhibit you from moving forward. Also in this category, there are three other items we see. Change in description, all right, of license premises. So let's just say this. You want, you have right now, you're located at 10 Main Street. You want to explain, uh, ex expand it to 12 Main Street, which is connected to you next door. You cannot expand and sell any alcohol in that area until you are approved by the local board and the ABC. So before you begin any construction, before you begin any plans to move forward, you want to fill out an application. You want to submit all the plans. You want to make sure you get, get approved before you go into that action. That's where you will reach out to the fire department, the police department, and also the building department if there are any issues in that area. This is what we talk about, ask in advance. And then when you apply for it and the local board grants it, you still cannot serve in that area until the ABC approves it and the local licensing board will issue you an amended license which will include the new area. Then at that point, you could serve alcohol in that area. Does everybody understand? We see people start the first part, apply for an alteration of premises, and then the next day they're serving there without approval. 
So it's very important. And what will happen on, give you an example of what happens on alteration of premises. The local board approves it. It comes into our office. We assign it to an investigator. An investigator will actually come out and do an on-site with you. What they do is they take the information you gave them, the layout, and the layout can be done by an architect. It can be done by a hand drawer. And we don't care if you submit it in crayon. As long as it's what the local board has approved, we concur what the local board's approval is, along with the guidelines and requirements of, uh, for extension of premises. Then, at that point, the investigator gives a recommendation, then it will come to myself, and then the recommendation will go to the commission. Once they approve it, automatically, it's real time, the application is sent back as approval to the local board. You have to go to your local board and get your amended application so it can be displayed on the licensed premises before you begin to serve there. Does everybody understand that? And then uh, one of the other major things is change of managers. We know that it's tough to get help. It's always been tough to get help, especially over the last three years. And we realize in the future it's going to be the same way. You remember one thing, when you get a manager approved, that, that if you are gonna change the manager either by the manager leaves or you have to dismiss them, uh, it's very important that immediately you uh, apply for a change of manager application. Now, it might take you two weeks, it might take you a month to find someone, so you wanna alert the local board right away that Ralph Sacrimony is no longer my manager. All right, I'm actively seeking, we'll follow up on an application shortly. You want to let them know. What happens in that intern is that you don't get shut down. You don't, the manager does not hold you hostage. All right, what you do, you have to have ample time and you have to take it upon yourself to quickly fill that position. So you go to our website, you fill out a change of manager's application, submit all the document to uh, Sylvia and the Brockton board, then it moves forward to the three-step approval. In the meantime, Anyone that's been approved as an officer, director, or shareholder can assume that position as the manager until the application is completed. Everybody understand that? So when you alert the local board, you could say, okay, uh, Ralph Sacrimony, my manager left, I am gonna, re uh, right now, covering the position is my partner, Gene Larizio, will be covering the position right now until we find someone. Now the local board and everybody is on the same page. Now you can't leave Gene there for a year. You have to do within 30 days get an application file, but now you are on the same page with the uh, local board. Now, most likely what the local board do will send a copy of your email to the ABC and say, this manager is no longer there, this person is covering their pending application, we cover forth and put that in your file. This way, if our investigators come and there's an issue, we say we want to talk to the manager, and then all of a sudden, uh, Ralph was the manager, and Gene says, no, I am, how do we really know you're, you're, you're the manager? We have no record of you. That document protects you if an issue happens. Does everybody understand that? And also, we understand certain things happen. Say a manager passes away. It's, it's sudden. This is what will protect you. All right? So you just can't wait a year to fill the position. You have to fill it in ample time. And then the last thing is hours. All right? This is operating hours. As everyone knows in the state, no one can operate after 2 a.m. There's only one exception to that rule, and those are the casinos in the state can operate the four. All right, whatever the hours are, the municipality grants you, and when you apply for your license, those are the hours you stick to. That includes days. So if you are right now open six days a week, and that's where you've been approved on your license, you cannot open the seventh day without getting approval from the local board. That jurisdiction is at the discretion of the local board to allow you to operate that seventh day. In reverse, you're open seven days, you just can't choose to close on a Monday without alerting the local board that you're gonna be closed on Mondays. Everybody understand that? And that's the quickest process to change hours. There's an application, there's no charge for that, that's one of the few items that you don't have to pay a $200 filing fee to change it. You just go online, fill out the documents, submit it to the local board, they'll officially approve your increase of hours and days or your decrease of hours and days. Now, we're not saying that if the weather is really bad, all right, and you're supposed to be open till uh, 1 a.m. and the weather's bad and you disguise, decide to close at, new, at midnight or 10 o'clock, that's not what this is about, all right? And we know with the pandemic, people's hours have changed. Some people have had stayed open to, to midnight and now have moved back to 11 p.m. If 11 p.m. is gonna be your permanent closing time, you should amend your hours. It doesn't cost you anything. It takes you five minutes to fill out that application. All right? 
Any questions on those subjects? Remember, anything you do that changes that original approval, you have to get permission by filing an application. Yes. That you're absolutely right. It's going to be called an alteration of premises. If this is what we originally approved and you are deciding to take down a permitted structure like a wall or add a wall, that's an alteration of premises. You would have to do that. So remember, it's not a change of location or, or, or expanding your location because you're working with the same blueprint. But you still have to follow through on filing that application. Any questions? All right, let's move to letter B. Outdoor seating. Of patios and uh, expansion of uh, premises. So let's talk about this. This has become very, very popular during the last two years with the pandemic. So if you uh, temporarily approved to use a sidewalk, to use a parking space, use a, uh, a public uh, way or so forth, that has been temporarily approved under the governor's executive order, and that will be staying in effect right now until April 1st of 2023. And basically what it does, is it allows all the discretion of outside seating in a temporary manner is overseen by the local licensing authority. You will apply to them, all right? They will uh, go through the process of approving you. And at that time, you're gonna use a sidewalk, you're gonna use a, a parking space or a public parking lot to have seating. There are guidelines and everything that is stipulated out there that you need to follow and the local board will approve according to those guidelines. That's the temporary order. You do not need to go through the three-step approval process. Now the big question is what's going to happen after April 1st, 2023? Is the temporary seating going to be allowed? I can't answer that question today. I don't know if, if the amount is going to be changed or the date's going to be extended and so forth. All right, That's also tied into takeout of alcohol. Uh, with a meal for any of the Section 12 or the Pharma Series licenses that serve food. So it's important to remember now, on the temporary order, you deal directly with the local board. If you are going to make it permanent, that's where you need to file an alteration of premises or an extension of premises application. And basically what you're doing is, I have this box right now that's been approved. I want to use this door and put a patio outside. That's the extension of premises. You have to follow the three-step approval process for that. And where you have to have, it's gonna be fill out an application, pay the $200 fee, submit your drawings, your corporate vote, everything you need, all right? Also, you have to work with your other departments. Follow up with the building department, the fire department, whatever items you're gonna need. Then you will apply to the local board. And then at that point, they will alert about it. They will have a public meeting. They approve you, it comes to the ABC, we sign an investigator, they will come out here and look at it, and then at that point, uh, if everything is uh, up to the standards that are required and meet all the guidelines, the ABC commissioners will approve it, it will go back to the town, the town will amend your license, but they may not issue your license until you have all, your, all the other departments are signed off. The building department signed off, the fire department, your certificates, everything is based on that. So that is to make it permanent. Now, anybody that has the ability to make it permanent, I'm telling you now, go ahead and apply for it for next year. All right, as you know, if there is no extension after April, you remember how many applications the ABC is gonna get flooded with? And we're telling you now, apply now if you meet the guidelines under local board for permanent action, get applied so when next April comes and you're ready to do outdoor seating, you'll have it all in advance. Don't wait until March because I guarantee you, you will not have it ready for April 1st when you want to open. So go on and apply now. I think you had your hand up, sir. That may be a local regulation. You need to probably deal with the question on the policy and procedures of, of the uh, city of Brockton. As what it says with the ABC is, no, if you are, 
if you are uh, allowed to operate till 2 a.m., no alcohol can be served after 2 a.m. The local board takes over all of the guidelines at that point. They may say everyone has to be off the premises in 15 or 20 minutes, or last call is at 1 a.m., so people aren't guzzling. Remember before last call used to be 15 minutes before closing, what would happen? Everybody run up there and get as many drinks as they could get and start guzzling. That's not what this point is about. So if the local board has a requirement of one hour before last call, and you do, that's the re, that, that is the requirement of the local board, you must follow that regulation or that condition. Yes? Let's take this example. So you're allowed to stay open to 2 a.m. And we know feasibility of, we're all out to try to make money. We're business people, and we understand that. So if you are realizing you're open to 2 a.m. and then on Mondays and Tuesdays it's very quiet and you may be closed at 1 a.m., I don't think the local board's gonna have a problem with that. But if you decide now to not open on Monday and Tuesday, then you're not on it. So you don't wanna lose your hours because some days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you may have enough of business to stay open to 2 a.m. That's okay. It's when you take the extreme and decide not to open. All right? And we know what weather. We know how it is. The weather comes. You, uh, you may have to close at 9 o'clock one night because it's so bad out. The local board is not going to penalize you. It's when you stray from your seven days a week to now only operate five days. We've had some people only decide to operate three days, and the local board charged them. We're not, not applying to the conditions of the license. Because they didn't just do it for like one time. All of a sudden it became part of their practice. So they're supposed to be open seven days a week. They're only open three days. So you want to use that discretion, work with the local board. And that's what the whole thing is about communication. And I don't think they're going to have a problem when you close in early. All right. But if, it's, if it becomes a standard practice, then you need to adjust your license. Any questions at all about outdoor seating? And remember... When you go outside seating, you are responsible for maintaining control of that area. That's why when the ABC uh, comes in and one of the big things you want to see is that if you are inside the restaurant, you can see what's going on out there. If it's a brick wall because it's a historical building or it's not financially sound to cut a window in, you need to put a manager out there or some type of personnel to see what's going on there at all times. All right? Remember, people have got very creative and especially minors. They found that if we, if there's outdoor seating, and just say for instance, you come in, there is three people in the party that are of age and one is underage. All right, we have seen, they always ask to sit outside, especially in areas where there's not a lot of supervision. So what's gonna happen? Y'all gonna go over to the table, y'all gonna check IDs, you saw three of them are of age, you're gonna give those three drinks. All right, what do you think's gonna happen with that fourth person if there's not supervision out there? That person's gonna end up in a drink. Is that a violation on your part? Yes, it is because you're responsible for any individual on your premises. If that person's in possession of alcohol, not that you sold to them, you could have a headache. So it's important, you want management out there at all time, and also, you're getting the privilege of outdoor seating, you also gotta remember the environment in the neighborhoods. All right, you can't have a, a, a place that's a wild west with noise and everything till two in the morning. That could affect you maintaining your license or the ability to use that area. So remember, you gotta maintain controls at all time. And we talk about barriers, you gotta, if you, the area you come in and you're saying it's 20 by 40 patio, you have to put some type of petitions out. Now we're not saying you have to put fencing up, we could say people use planters, people use boxes, they use all different things, chains, whatever it is to, to delineate that area is the most important. Because you wanna stop people from just walking into it, you can have an entrance out there, but you also wanna be able to meet the fire code. All right, and access, that's the most important. You wanna be able to have uh, two exits, uh, uh, two entrances in there so people can get out if there is an emergency. You're gonna treat it the same way as you're inside. 
And then if you're adding any additional things like coverings and heaters, you must make sure you check with the building and fire department that they meet the code of what you need. Any questions on that? Those two areas are the biggest amount of mistakes we see people make. Lack of control and not getting permission to do it. Any questions? All right, let's move to letter C. Purchasing of alcohol from authorized sources. So this is very simple. In Massachusetts, there is a law saying that a restaurant, a package store, a club, a continual care facility, a tavern, uh, a general on-premises, you only can purchase alcohol from an authorized source. What is an authorized source or who is an authorized source? It is any Massachusetts wholesaler, any Massachusetts manufacturer. When I talk about manufacturing, I'm talking about a farmer, winery, brewery, distillery. They are also the ability to sell to you. You cannot decide, because you see a better price in New Hampshire, to have product brought in from New Hampshire, or Rhode Island, or Connecticut. All product must be purchased through the Massachusetts uh, wholesaler or a manufacturer. Why? Okay, everybody knows there's a lot of pirated alcohol out there. Items that say Johnny Walker, but it's not Johnny Walker in that bottle. And if you, oh, I got a fantastic deal on it, that all falls on you. Because it's not only a state violation, it's also gonna be a federal violation that you're gonna be dealing with. So you wanna make sure you're buying from authorized sources. And along with that, if you own multiple restaurants, every license is based on the premises or on that thing. You cannot buy alcohol for your restaurant located at 10 Main Street and then transfer it to one Broadway. That's not how it works. Everything is delineated to the license. So you purchase alcohol for each location. You can't consolidate, buy, and then distribute. The reason why? Both licenses are gonna be a violation. Because if I have everything delivered to 10 Broadway and then I'm distributed to my other two restaurants, I'm acting as a wholesaler. So that's a violation. You don't have the authority to act as a wholesaler. And then both of your restaurants that are receiving it is gonna get charged with buying alcohol from an unauthorized source. So it's very simple. Now, package stores cannot go to big box stores. All right, and the reason why I'm telling you this is we have had violations before. There are special packs for, for like a BJ's or a Costco, all right? And they, some of them may have 42 packs of uh, a beer. They're the only ones that sell that is BJ's and Costco. So if you were to go there and we walk into your store to do a regular site visit, we see cases of 42 pack there. We're gonna say, can we see the invoice? All right? And there's no Massachusetts wholesaler that's gonna sell that pack to you because that's a special pack for the box stores. So right off the bat, here's two things that happen. Number one, you're charged with a violation. Number two, we confiscate that alcohol as contraband. All right, and then you appear in front of our commission, and at that point, if the commission finds you, uh, finds that you are guilty of violating, that product gets destroyed. So you're losing the product you thought you were saving money on. You don't get it back. We don't sell it off to anybody. It gets destroyed at a hazardous waste uh, plant. So realize, if you're taking that option to bring product in from out of state, you take an option to buy from unauthorized sources, you're gonna lose that product and you're gonna be charged. And the commission takes it very, very seriously on that in reference to doing that. Any questions on that? Same thing for a restaurant. You can't decide to go buy, oh, I see down the street they're having a sale on Tito's. I'm gonna go down there and buy a case of Tito's. You can't do that. And people say, well, what happens if I run out of Tito's that night? Tough. You cannot run down to the package store and buy it. Does everybody understand that? That's very, very important. Now, most likely what happens now, when you get charged with the violation of uh, buying alcohol from an unauthorized source, most likely down the line, you'll be getting a knock on your door, most likely an order from the Department of Revenue. Because the Department of Revenue is gonna say, okay, you're not tracking this through a wholesaler, because they audit the wholesaler when they're gonna audit you. They say how much product you buy to match up with what you're claiming on your meals, taxes, and alcohol sales, and so forth, so it's important that you want to do the right thing. You don't want to have one headache with the ABC and the second one with the Department of Revenue. It's very, very important on that. Someone had their hand up back there with a question? Go ahead, sir.
Yep, we, we do have a list available. If you have any problems, just reach out to one of our contact members and we'll make sure you get it. Absolutely, that's a good choice. Because if somebody knocks on your door and says, I, I have all this wine, all right, and you have never dealt with them before, there are a lot of people that just like come out of a, come from out of state, throw 50 cases of wine in the truck and they drive around to sell it. All you have to do is, can I see your ABC license? It'll say right on it, Sacrimony Distributors Section 18. Or Sacrimony Manufacturing Section 19, it tells you the year. Then that, they're a Massachusetts wholesaler. All right, or a manufacturer. Just remember that deal may not be worth it because what's in that bottle may not be what the product is supposed to be. And that's to protect everybody. Just think about one thing that uh, uh, Chief Edwards said earlier. Remember, any good lawyer, if someone gets sick from that product, any good lawyer is coming after everybody. All right? So they're not just come after uh, that person selling it. They're going to come after you bought that illegal product and you sold it. So protect yourselves. Any questions on that? All right. Did I miss? Yes, go ahead. Well, here's the issue you have, is that that is a business contract between the wholesalers. They have territories, they have franchisees. It's been going on since 1933 when prohibition was lifted. And, and the problem you have, it's because of the deals they make with the manufacturers. So you're coming into the state, you have, uh, we'll just take an item, and I'm not just using this example, you have Heineken comes in. Heineken has certain distributors in the state, and those distributors have territories and so forth. And I know it's been frustrating with supply and demand, especially during the pandemic over the last three years. See, it's a business contract among them. We don't really oversee the business, the contract, but if you feel you're being discriminated against on product, there is an avenue you could come and, and file uh, with the commission on that. But if it has to do with supply and demand and, and, and territorial rights, that's a business agreement among the wholesalers not with the ABC. What we want to make sure that you're not being discriminated against. They're not selling the product to you because someone else is buying more. That's a different issue and so forth. I mean, I, I think that probably you don't find out your item is back on until the delivery comes, correct? So you're already stuck in that area. It, 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 it's a tight line because of the business contracts people have. But if you're feeling that you guys, that your place is being discriminated against or in reference to getting product, you, we could talk a little bit more after this. There's a, there's, a, there's a procedure you can do, but as far as supply and demand and territorial rights, it's done on business contracts outside of the ABC. It's been around for the longest time. I know it's frustrating. I know that may not be the answer, but I want to be honest with you. It's nothing that the commission can say, hey, you are in this area, you have to sell to them because they have territorial rights that have been going on. And especially, I know it's very common in the Bay Area, area and also a lot of the higher end uh, 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 the still beverages and so forth that they have. Okay, so the ABC monitors us. Who's actually monitoring them? We monitor them too. That's what it is. That's why if you think, no, no, we don't have control over their business contracts. We could, we have control over their business practices. If you feel that you're not, you're being discriminated against, and you have evidence that the person next door is getting the product and you're not getting it, 
There, there's a process we can follow through. If you do file a complaint, we have a whole investigation and complaint division. We'll look into it where they'll reach out to the wholesaler, they'll reach out to you. So there is an avenue there and, and so forth for that to happen. Yes. Well, I think there's two things. Remember one thing, the one of the uh, uh, authority that the ABC has given, if you look under uh, Chapter 138, which is Mass General Law, the Liquor Control Act, is we stabilize the industry. We make sure, we, try, we go across the board to try to make sure everybody is being treated fair. But if there is a contract between a manufacturer and one distributor to carry that product in the state, they have the right to do that. It may not be fair to everyone, but if you feel that you are being discriminated or forced to buy all of their products in order to get that, that's a complaint you can file with the ABC. So if y'all feel that y'all being boxed in because you only want to take, I'm just not saying this happened, you only want to take Jack Daniels, and they're saying, well, if you take Jack Daniels in order to get that, you're going to take these other items. If you have evidence to show that to us, there is a complaint process that will be followed through. You have to remember is that if there's only one distributor in the state, that's a business contract between them and Jack Daniels Corporation. All right, we can't say every wholesaler's got to carry everybody's product because it's all business agreements made between manufacturers, out-of-state manufacturers, and in-state wholesalers. But if you feel you're discriminated, that's what I'm saying. If you feel you're not being treated, there's a whole complaint line that you can reach out to us, we'll give you the process, and we guarantee one thing at the ABC, every complaint filed with us, no matter how small it is or how great it is, we follow up on everything. I just be honest with everybody, we take public safety first. So we get a complaint on the same day and it's saying from a parent that there's underage drinking going on at this facility, that goes to the top of the list. Then your, your item will follow it, but we will get to it. We follow back with everybody we call. So if you feel there is that going on, uh, feel free to give us a call or feel free to file a complaint. And there's only so much we can do because it's business agreements outside of our control. So, but remember one thing, if you think there's an issue going on, feel free to reach out to us and we will definitely look into it. Yes. File a complaint on that. Call us up, file a complaint, and we, we will follow up. Remember now, the issue you have right now is supply and demand. There's a shortage of a lot going on. All right, that may be an avenue that they're going to show, but if you're feeling that you are being discriminated against not to get that product and you have evidence of, of it, file the complaint with us. We will look at it. I can't say it will work out positive for you. I can't say it will work out negative. But we remember one thing, we investigate everything. And realize, I want to be honest with you, it's not a 24-hour investigation that you get back. Because we might have other people saying the exact same thing, so it may be a much larger investigation. So you, you can't call in for statuses on it, because once you give it to us and we start the investigation, it's locked. At that point, we're moving forward with our team to figure out if there is some type of uh, issue going on. Any other questions? All right, the next area has become a hot topic delivery between Amazon, uh, uh, Whole Foods, between uh, direct shipping of wine. A big part of our business, especially during the pandemic, was where, where our constituents and our customers weren't coming to us and we had to figure a way to deliver to them. Delivery is very, very important. So I'm gonna start with the first section, which is package stores. Package stores, you have the right to deliver. Uh, as long as you are in possession of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 22, Transportation Permit. It's a very simple permit. There's three or four questions you answer, and uh, 
you apply directly with the ABC. It does not go through the local licensing authority. It's $150 fee per vehicle per year, per calendar year. So it's January 1st or December 31st. And what that allows you to do is license that vehicle. We ask you for the registration, the plate number. You can take your product and you can deliver it anywhere in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. All right, it's a great device for you to use. Also, you can hire a third party to deliver for you. You have all these companies out there, Uber, DoorDash, GoPuff. They all can deliver for you under one stipulation that they present to you their license with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And their license will be called an express transportation permit. And what it does, it'll show you there's a master license that will show you that their license and each vehicle that's working for you will have a certificate in it. Now, the reason why I say that, as you know, if you get the permit yourself, or you're using a third party. Just as you check an ID at your register, if you're using your own vehicles, the ID check and, and, the, and, the, and the rule to make sure that no one under the age of 21 is, is receiving that alcohol falls on you. You have to make sure your drivers are trained, that they're checking IDs and you're backing yourself up either by scanning them, taking photos of them. You want to make sure that that individual that you're delivering to is of age because it all ties together. If you're using a third party person, ask to see their policy and procedures, ask to see their ID checking guides. How are they doing it? How are they making sure that they're you, they're, the honest place for you, you're hiring someone else to deliver it for you you don't think if something happens and that product ends up in a minor's hand and that minor gets in a car and kills someone, a good attorney is not going to backtrack it all the, to, all the way to where an alcohol comes from? You just don't eliminate once you give it to that person. You want to be able to audit them that they're doing the right thing. It could be every night to send you a file saying every place we delivered to, uh, there was an ID. You want to protect yourself. Does everybody understand that? All right, and also now jumping over to restaurants. Uh, did I see? Oh, yes, go ahead. It's right on our website. If you go to under amendments, you have the ability to look for transportation, and you'll click it right onto there. Transportation for a section 15 or a section 12. Excuse me, not for a section 12. We'll talk about that in a minute. For section 15. And when I talk about section 15, that's... All alcohol is served for off-premise consumption. Does everybody understand that? You sell them in the original packaging, they take it, they consume it off your premises. They can't open the bottle and start drinking on your premises, that's a violation. So when I talk about off-premises, that's what I mean by section 15. On section, on, uh, section 12, that's all on-premise consumption. That's if you are a hotel, a club, a restaurant, any place that, that is serving alcohol for on-premise consumption. Now. During the pandemic, uh, there's been an exception for it right now is that we're allowing until April 1st through uh, the governor's executive order, the ability for a section 12 or on-premise licensee who serves food to sell alcohol with a meal to go. And you do not need a transportation permit. The commission waived that right uh, because if you're, if you're delivering for yourself, because it's only a short term thing, we didn't want you to incur the cost of it because it, it most likely is gonna be going away in April, is that you have the ability, as long as you are, it's your employer, you're self-delivering, you do not need a transportation permit. But alcohol only can be served with a male and there's limits. You only can sell 194 ounces of malt beverages, a liter and a half of wine, and uh, 64 ounces of mixed drinks in a sealed container. And we don't care how you seal it, all right? So if you're sending out margaritas, it's gonna be sealed in some type of container. All right, during the transport stage, and you are under your direct supervision, one of your employees or yourself can deliver that without a license. If you hire a third party carrier, like Uber, DoorDash, they have to be licensed. All right, everybody remember that. They have to be licensed. And the same rule goes it's an extension of you checking at a table for someone who is uh, of age. Same rule goes, you want to make sure these third parties have all the procedures in place that they're not delivering alcohol. And I'll give you an example. Some of these companies did not do a good job. We did a compliance check on one company. We did 23 compliance checks. And what a compliance check is, we actually staged a delivery with, a, with an underage person. That person filled 23 out of 23 compliance checks. So if they're delivering alcohol for you, you have no idea what the end of the road is. That's why it's up to you to make sure policy and procedures are in place, that you can cross-check what they're doing. 
Now, there's a lot of companies that do a good job. All right, I'm not saying all, oh, but the onus is on you. Because you just know when you turn it over that you're scot-free. Everybody understand that? So it's really important. Now, that ability to deliver is going to be good to April 1st of 2023. Now, I know this talk of possibly expanding it or ending it. I can't speak on that, but I wanted to give everybody a heads up on what we see. We do see a lot of problems. And around college communities, a lot of the students have figured it out. Who checks IDs and who don't check IDs? So we're working with local police departments, campus police, we're performing a lot of things, and we will tell you now, we are performing compliance checks on deliveries. So anybody working with you, back yourself up that they have a procedure and you make sure you audit them that it's being done. That protects your license also. Any, yes? Well, that, but they're actually working for you also. So you want to have backup at the end of the day that that person that delivered that to a household checked that ID and protected. So you want to make sure there's policy and procedures in place. You know what they're doing because you hire them to deliver your alcohol. All right? Or you're in a contract with these people to deliver. You want to make sure you're protecting yourself. That's what, at the end of the day, is you are working with that delivery company to make sure that that person at the end that received it is uh, uh, of age. Any manner you want to do it, requiring a picture of the ID, like what UPS and there's other companies now are scanning them, so at the end of the day they could say when you check it or if you audit them, that product that went to 65 uh, Cedar Street was delivered to this person, here's a picture of their ID, or here's a scan of their ID, so you know you're protecting yourself. Because the end of the day, is we all don't want to have a problem with underage drinking. We don't want to see, you know what happens, it leads from binge drinking to assaults to someone getting in the car and killing an innocent person or killing them themselves. Any good lawyer is gonna work the trail all the way back to where that alcohol originated from. Protect yourself. Make sure that those, are, those procedures are in place and you can prove that it was done right. Yes. It's up to you to, I mean, that's the question you should be answering. How do I want to know what's protected? You wanted them to show you documents. You want them to have some eye in place. I'll give you an example who does a great job at it is UPS. UPS, now, when they're delivering alcohol is for like out-of-state wineries with direct shipment. The direct, the, the uh, person calls the, what they call 19F direct shipper, they place their order, the product is filled, UPS brings it, what UPS does is they have such a strict policy. Sometimes they're only delivering the alcohol to the person who placed it and they're checking the ID. They're scanning it, all right, or they're taking some type of picture out of it and on the box and they're following all the rules that this can't, this is, uh, remember, alcohol is a controllable substance. So that's why they take it very seriously. And that's what you may want to require of the company you're hiring and for them to be able to show you that that delivery was done. Now, if they can't show you that it was done right, you gotta think about it. Is it worth using them or go to another company? It's up to you for your business. It's all protecting where that product ends up at the end of the, at the, end of the world. Yes? Uh, just curious, how does uh, Uber uh, eat points on this? Uh, I don't think there's any case uh, that I wonder if, uh, why the Liverpool is uh, something that they ought to do. I, I don't understand the question, what was uh, it? I said, I wonder if Well, I, I can't say Uber itself, we have seen that they're not following the rules, but you're hiring Uber, that's what I keep saying. You want them to tell you how are they making sure that product's not ending up in underage. Let them show you positive procedures and then check them. Ask at the end of the night, can I see a way that you can prove to us? You know what I mean? And you gotta remember, uh, alcohol is a controllable substance. You have to do all you can to, to make sure you're not delivering alcohol to an underage individual, just like you have the authority to protect the welfare of everybody that's in your building while they're there. 
It's the exact same thing, in and out, so you want to make sure. Any questions on that? Yes. Well, I, I won't say you lie, but you did your due diligence. A person walked in, they are of age 21, you checked the ID, you did it a thing, it was a real ID, you did right, you sold to them. When they go down the street and give it to someone else, that is a criminal charge. They're supplying alcohol for an, uh, to an underage individual. Would you be responsible if you did everything right? In that situation, most likely you will not. All right, what they do after an underage, like someone that just goes down the street, like they gave them $20 to go in and buy alcohol from a pack store, that's where the police can charge them criminally. All right, because they're furnishing alcohol with intent. So that's the key there. Oh, so you're talking about like an, uh, like a, an ID brochure, brochure? Yes, okay. We don't recommend, listen, we don't come up here and promote scanners and so forth, but scanners are good. You just got to make sure you get a scanner that can update it. Kyle's going to talk about this in a few minutes. One thing that I will re recommend to you, one of the training tools we use for the ABC investigators, it's called ID Checking Guide. It's idcheckingguide.com. It's a great product because it's updated every year. It's like $15 to $17 of the booklet. It shows you every state license. And if you want to push it to get uh, passports and everything else, it shows you across the board what you need. It's a great tool. That's how we change our, uh, train our investigators. And we also take that and we train local police departments so that they can see it. So that's a good tool right there. Scanners are good. You just got to make sure your scanner updates. All right, because you know how quick the, the forgers are. They figure out the scanner and then they stop forging them. You want to protect yourself. Remember, when Kyle talks about IDs, he'll give you uh, some good guidance on that. Any questions on that? All right, I want to move to the next phase, and I want to introduce Kyle Gill. Kyle Gill is our Associate General Counsel, all right? And one thing to realize about Kyle Gill, of course, he's an attorney. Also, this is the person you will see across from you if you are caught on a violation. Kyle is a prosecuting attorney for the Investigation Enforcement Division. So Kyle's going to give you some great tools to help you stay out of trouble. Thank you, Kyle. As Ralph just mentioned, my name is Kyle Gill. It's nice to meet you all, and as Ralph alluded to, if you haven't met me before, that might be a good thing. But um, right now, I'm just going to touch on one of our most common violations at the ABCC, and that involves um, minors um, either being delivered or sold alcohol, or actually being in possession of it. Um, right now, just in general, compliance checks, our investigators have been the entire summer and into the fall doing compliance checks all across the state. I've seen them all come in, and I've also seen that Brockton, they've not visited Brockton yet. So you may want to th think about that, that they haven't been there yet, and they're still doing them. So it could be next week, it could be two weeks from now. Um, ABCC underage operative could be visiting your establishment soon, j just to let you know. And guess how you pass the compliance checks? You ask for an ID. As soon as you ask for, for an ID, the, the first step, our operatives turn around and they walk out your, um, your business and, and you pass the compliance check. Now obviously there are um, other types of um, violations that can happen with, with regard to underage coming in and, and trying to purchase alcohol from you. Now there are six types of identifications in which if someone presented that to you and um, if they, and you reasonably lied and said, yes, this, per this ID says they're 21, um, you can use this as a defense if they end up not being 21. And that's with a valid Massachusetts driver's license, a, um, a Massachusetts liquor ID, a Massachusetts ID card, a United States passport, a United States passport card, as well as a military ID. If someone presents these to, to you and you reasonably rely on it and make the sale and delivery of alcohol to them, and they end up not being 21 years of age, you may still get called in before the Brockton or maybe us, but now you have evidence, you say, I reasonably relied on this ID and it's one of the six acceptable forms. And you may, may very well not be found in violation. Um, question? Sure thing, so it's a um, United, I'm sorry, a Massachusetts driver's license, a Massachusetts liquor ID, a Massachusetts identification card, a United States passport, 
a United States passport card, as well as a military ID. And what I was going to say is there's one glaring um, ID missing from that list, and that is out-of-state licenses. You accept out-of-state licenses at your own risk. It's strict liability. It can be the person on the, there that says that, that they're over 21. You may even have a scanner in which that scanner says that it's a, it's a real ID. You do not have that protection with, with, for out-of-state IDs. If they end up being under 21, it's strict liability no matter what. And, then, and I know Ralph touched on the IDs, the, the um, ID scanners. The ID scanners are a great tool. They are not perfect. We see often that genuine, I mean, fraudulent identifications are so good they actually scan as real in these scanners. Ralph alluded to that the, the scanners that update, that are trying to constantly um, find the, um, the marks that the people that are making these fraudulent IDs n don't know of yet. Those updates are great because it is a competition between the companies that, or the illegal businesses that are creating these identifications and then the scanning companies that, that are trying to catch them. So they are a good tool, but they are not perfect. Ultimately, if you look at the person in front of you and they look like a, t a teenager, you have the right not to serve them no matter what, what they show you. Um, any questions on that? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Y yes, sir? It's a very common practice. Ultimately, the law is, it's actually a, a criminal law. It's sale or delivery of alcohol. So for me to say that a bartender just trusting someone at the door absolves them, I, I certainly can't say that. Um, but I do know it's a common practice that there will be one person at the um, front of the door that is responsible for checking IDs. We, we know that that is a common practice. It, it doesn't suffice if the person's under 21, that, that's for sure. Um, they, protect, they can certainly protect themselves by rechecking, um, especially if they, if they have a question or concern that this person's under 21. That's a great question, and that goes into the reasonable reliance. So if someone presents an identification, say it's their older brother, and you look at them, they, they look alike, it's a valid ID, I think that's a very, very defensible um, situation. But now you have someone um, who looks completely different. They have a different height, different chin, different eye, eye color. Um, we're going to argue that you didn't use reasonable reliance there. That's someone else's face on that ID, and you should have, you should have been able to recognize that, even though it's a Massachusetts license. So th that is a very good point to bring up, sir. I have one more question. Yeah, of course. So, It's always safe. Now, we, I have heard plenty of times, even for compliance checks, is a, a clerk will say, I thought I had ID'd them before. I thought they were one of our regulars. So it's always um, the safest practice to ID everyone. But, I mean, common sense dictates this. If you know someone that's, that comes in your, your establishment every, every Friday and they've been coming in for 10 years and you know they're, they're in their 40s or 50s, no, I, I would say, yeah, you, you, wouldn't, you might not ID them, obviously. A any other questions? Uh, I'm sorry, 
So ultimately with all these, um, so the six acceptable forms of ID give you a defense. But just like an out-of-state license, if it's a foreign passport, it only becomes a problem is, is if that foreign passport ends up being fake and the person's under 21. You can accept it, but ultimately you're taking the risk. If that person's over 21, there's no violation, and you accepted it, that, that, that's fine. It only becomes a problem when the person who you just served alcohol is under 21, and that passport ends up being fake. You just don't have that defense like you would a United States passport in the law. Any other additional questions on those issues? Okay, I'm gonna jump in now to something that Ralph alluded to uh, earlier, and that's the passing off of alcohol. That's another, um, th that we see a lot at the ABC seeing a lot of violations concerning that, especially with, Ralph said, the outdoor areas that might not be as well supervised. Ultimately, you're responsible to keep sufficiently close supervision of your premises. So, as Ralph said, if you have a group of table with some are over 21 and some are under 21 and they're passing drinks and they're drinking, our investigators come in, your, your establishment's gonna be found in violation because you were supposed to be keeping supervision of the alcohol and making sure that that, that did not occur. I'm gonna move on now to um, what we call the, our last place of drink, uh, the 24J reports. And um, we get a lot of questions on these. Um, in the, uh, just to describe what these are is every time someone is convicted or pleads guilty to an OUI in Massachusetts, under oath in front of a clerk magistrate at the end of it, they are asked, where did you have your last place of drink? Sometimes they just say private, but sometimes they do name an establishment in the Commonwealth that has a liquor license. What happens is the courts will record that. It goes to the, um, the clerk magistrate's office that, that sends it out to, they send it to the attorney general's office, and they also send a copy to us. Now what our chief investigator does with that is he tracks them, he tracks them all, we get them from every court in the state, he keeps a giant Excel spreadsheet with all of them and he tracks how many each establishment gets. Now, sometimes, we, and we know this at the ABCC, that they're not always the most reliable. We've had, some, we've had someone say that they were at a Red Sox game at Fenway and we, we checked the calendar and saw that the Red Sox were out of town on, on one of them. They're not the most reliable and we don't, we're not the keeper of the record, so if you believe there's a mistake, we're not the ones that create it. We just really track it. But what I can tell you is that now there's a few of those, now there's a half dozen of these that we received. Our, investi our chief investigator is going to notice that and they're going to send an undercover investigator into your establishment and they're going to, they'll even order a drink and, and pretend they're a patron and they're going to watch how you do your business. If they see someone slurring their words, acting loud and obnoxious, can't even stand up straight, and you serve them alcohol after they make those observations, they show those signs of intoxication, you're gonna be fined in violation. And, and right next to, at the top of the list of serving underage is serving intoxicated. Those are, right next to each other are 1A, 1B as, what, as to what our investigators um, put as priority. Um, is there any questions with regard to that topic? I don't believe so, thank you. And I will move on now to hours of, uh, hours of operation. So it sounds like in the city of Brockton there may be some strict rules with re stricter rules with regard to um, closing and making sure that everyone's off your premises by a certain time and, and last call and that such. Um, you have to follow those hours and certainly you, you can't have um, sale um, of alcohol past your, um, pa past your closing hours, past your approved hours from the local board and the ABCC. Now I'm gonna to jump to the LLAs and the ABCC's right to inspect premises. I know you heard Ralph speak earlier that a license is a privilege, it's not a right. There is a misconception that if someone, the police or an ABCC investigator wants to come into your establishment, oh, you need a warrant. No, they don't. This is not like your home. This is, you have a license open to the public. If you shut the door on them, you're in violation of hindering an investigation. It's chapter 138, um, section 63A, and it actually there's criminal penalties for that. Same with the local police. You can't just shut them out. You have to cooperate. If there's cameras that you have footage of something they want to look at, and you have that footage, if they request it, 
you by law are required to give it to them um, because you, you have a liquor license here for the most, almost all licensees are open to the public and um, it, it, you're required to do that. Um, is there any questions on, on that topic? Private clubs, are, so if, if it's a licensed premises, and, and remember, private clubs, guests of members um, are allowed to go in. The same thing, yes. If Whatever's on the licensed premises as approved, you have to let the ABCC, whenever, whenever they want to inspect and, and um, do an investigation in your club. Same with any agent of the local board. Um, a lot of times, the lo local police, so the Brockton Police Department would be another... Um, if they're trying to invest, investigate something with regard to your alcohol license, you, you can't shut them out. Any other questions on that? Uh, that would be that typically function halls are, are licensed a lot of times like a, um, a as a club, um, but but anyways, it, it would fall under the same the same concept that if you if you have a on premise premises liquor license. You have to, you can't shut out or can't lock out Brockton Police or our ABCC investigators. They have the right to um, inspect your premises and make sure it's in compliance with the law. Yes? Sir. So the actual uh, citation for this, it's Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 138, Section 63A. Um, that's the exact law. And um, really, it just requires um, like liquor license holders to um, comply with investigations of both state and local authorities. Just li liquor licenses. So no, if you're having a, if you're having a party at your house that's not licensed, um, that does not apply. Unless you have a argue, never mind. Any other questions with regard to that? And then, and then finally, the last topic I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss is um, the age to handle alcohol over the course of someone's employment. So if you have employees um, who are 18, 19, 20 years old, they are allowed to handle alcohol in the course of their employment. They are allowed to accept orders, pour drinks, deliver drinks, bus tables, clear tables with alcohol in it, everything um, in the course of their employment. However, if they're under 18, they're 17 years old, they cannot handle alcohol at all um, in their jobs. That, that would be a violation. Yes, sir? Correct. They, they, you can be a bartender at 20 years old. Um, you obviously, they can't consume a after work. They, they certainly can't, um, can't drink with, with their colleagues. That's completely um, not allowed. However, in the course of their employment, they, they can't handle alcohol. Yes, sir? Yes, th that also includes bar backing as well, yes. Does anyone have any questions on any of the topics I covered? Sir? Yes. So the question, the, the difficulty with that one is, it depends how they do it is really the answer. Now, our, we have happy hour um, prohibitions in the state, and one of those includes you can serve more than two drinks at a time to one person. So arguably, if there's someone, a, a dedicated waitress or waiter, pouring drinks and making sure that the measurements are, are consistent and in each, no beverage that's given to one person um, is over two drinks at a time, then it's, um, then I, I would say that that sounds like that's lawful. However, when you just put a bottle on a table, leave it, and then a patron's drinking from the bottle, they're pouring double, triple shots to everyone around it in full glasses, that, 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 that would be a violation of the happy hour regulations in the Commonwealth because you're giving someone um, more alcohol than they're allowed to have. Also, in that same point, you also can't give discounts for a um, large amount of alcohol. So just because someone purchased a large amount of alcohol doesn't mean that you can now give them a discount for that. 
Um, it, it, has to, it has to be the same as it would a, a basic drink. Um, the, the proportions have to be the same. That, 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 is, that is not an ABCC rule. <laughs> but but cover, cover charges must be posted. That, 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 is, uh, that is an ABCC rule. Does anyone have any additional questions on, it, on any, any topics I uh, brought up? Thank you, everyone. And at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Ralph, and he's going to discuss um, the club licenses. Thank you, everyone. We just need five more minutes of everybody's time. We started late, so I just want to five minutes and then good thing about it uh, our entire team will be here after if anybody has additional questions we will definitely be available as much time as you need at this point in time i want to introduce deputy executive director ryan melville hi everybody i'll be quick uh it's renewal season so you'll be receiving your renewals from the city of brockton there's absolutely zero excuse not to renew your license on time i've heard them all we're not going to Ultimately, you have to sign your renewal in the month of November. If you don't sign in the month of November, you're not going to be licensed next year. So that means you have to stop operation December 31st at midnight. Um, depending on what we can get done with, if the city of Brockton wants to help you out uh, and have a, a hearing in the month of December, then they can ultimately we will do everything we can to make sure you're still operating. There's very, you know, uh, there's absolutely zero excuse. So Brock, Sylvia is very good. I've been working with her for years, so she knows her stuff. She'll get that out to you. The fire department told you today exactly what you need to do to get your fire safety certificate, so there's no excuse not to get that. So if it comes time that you time to renew, make sure you renew your license. This is obviously what your business depends on. There's zero excuse, okay? So only an approved officer, director, or the license manager that has been approved can sign the renewal. So if you're having a changeover of your officers and directors, if you're a club or you're changing, you're losing an employee that's a manager, you can only have who's currently assigned, been approved sign that renewal. Make sure you do that. If somebody that has not been approved signs that renewal, you can lose your, it's an automatic revocation of your license. Okay, because that's, you cannot do that. So do not do that. Make sure whoever it is signs it. When you get your renewal from the city, immediately start processing that. Get it back to them in the month of November. Don't wait till the last day is the, uh, Deputy Chief had mentioned it happens all over the state that people start reaching out to get their fire safety certificates, which is extremely important, so don't wait. Uh, the second thing I'll just say is the head of the licensing department, keep an eye out on our website. We have our frequently asked questions. Most of the questions you're going to ask today are found in our frequently asked questions on the website. I send it to Sylvia in every email I send out to cities and towns. They have that available. It does away with a lot of the uh, blue law, old, wise tale stuff that you hear out there in the business. Read that, go through it, give it to new employees. They'll identify what they need to do to make sure you're operating in compliance, which is what we all want to do. The other thing is, too, we're going to be having all the frequently asked questions translated into uh, multiple languages. I'll make sure I'll let Sylvia know about that so that she can forward it out to you. So if you have anybody that speaks specifically Portuguese, Spanish, we're going to have a couple other languages in there, that they'll be able to read that so your staff can read it and understand it as well. If you have any other questions, we'll be here with everybody else to help you out. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Last two subjects before we wrap up. Number one, I want to get rid of the fallacy. If anybody walks in, a, a parent and child walk in to your facility, and, the, and the, uh, the child is under the age of 21, and the parent says, you know, it's okay, he's with me, I'm going to let him drink. That's not allowed on your licensed premises. On your licensed premises, under Chapter 138, the Liquor Control Act says, no one can consume or purchase alcohol under the age of 21. So if their parent is there, their brother is there, that's all squat. Everybody understand that? That does, that's different if you're in a home. Whatever you want to do in a private home, you do it. But don't let them put your license in jeopardy. All right? And I know it's a tough situation because some of them are going to get up and leave, but it's better let them leave than selling a $10 drink and then have to be paying a $10,000 fine to the ABC. All right, so think about it. So that fallacy is gone out there. The last thing is clubs. And the clubs I'm talking about are clubs like the Knights of Columbus, fraternal organization, our Catholic organizations, the Moose, the Elks. You are a private club. You are not open to the public. That means a club license is for members and friends of members. The local licensing authority can add many conditions to that license, like requiring a sign-in book, 
for a non-member, that that non-member can't stay on the premises once the uh, a member leaves and so forth. So remember, a club cannot advertise, oh, we're having a New Year's Eve party to the public because you're not open to the public. Does everybody understand that? All right, and the same thing with underage. You can't say, oh, my son's in here, we're at a private club, we can do what they want. You cannot, it's a licensed premises. Everybody understand that? Uh, Nonprofit organizations that engage in like renting out their function hall, you get permission from your local board that they understand what is going on on that. All right? Can you rent it out to members and friends of members? Yes, you can. But you should check with your local board if they're authorizing you to do that. Does everybody understand that? I just wanted to get that out of the way. A private club follows the same rules, and your closing time is the exact same closing time as everybody else that stays on your license. You could, if the local board allows you to stay in class that time, but all alcohol service ceases. Everybody understand that? Yes. You, that's on our website? Yeah. 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 Yeah, honestly, I have never seen that. I would have to look at it for a comment on it. I'm worried about any premises that is licensed. I just want to get rid of that old story. We'll take a look at that, but just, it just says what I'm stating here. You're under the age of 21, you cannot purchase or consume alcohol on a licensed premises. It's your responsibility, all right? So it, it's key. So if anybody comes in and says, I'm authorized, this is my daughter, my son, my godchild, uh, we're wonderful, they're related to you, but you're not getting no alcohol here, because you can't. All right, we're gonna wrap it up, and I just want the chairman of the board to come back on. We'll be here to answer as many questions as you want. Chairman? Just want to thank everyone again for actually staying and being president and asking questions. This is being filmed by BCA, so this will be on the website, YouTube, so you can definitely, um, definitely view it later or any of your employees or anybody that you know, needs the information. I just want to bring up Sylvia for two seconds. Sylvia, if you could just come up. Sylvia does probably just like, what, Jeff? Um, but Sylvia is our executive's assistant. Like, again, Sylvia is an office of one. It might seem like she has eight arms, but she is just human. Um, but I just wanted, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna um, have Sylvia just say a few words about just applications, when they have to be in, um, advertisements for if you're selling a store, changing management or anything like that. Um, but I just want everyone to know, I mean our, our fabulous attorneys in the back as well, um, I just want everybody to know that Hank Tagli, when I first joined the board about four years ago, we are here to keep you in business. We're not here to make up violations and stuff like that. I frequent a lot of the establishments that are in this room today. We are here, the commissioners, the uh, ABCC, um, lieutenant, deputy chief, the law department, we are here to keep you in business. So allow us to keep you in business. Please follow the rules. We do not want to have the attorneys get involved with violations and different things. Sylvia, can you just explain just a couple of things on uh, renewals? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, you know, I'm always available. You can call with any questions or concerns. Uh, renewals are going out. They'll be out soon. Um, and of course, like the um, ABCC mentioned, they have to be signed during the month of November. So. There's no after November, and you can't come in before November 1st. So start filling it out. Call the fire department, building department. Make sure that you get your certificate of inspection. That's important because you will not get your license on January 1st if that's not in with your application. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. Before you leave, I just want everyone to thank Sylvia, because she organized today, and also Deputy Chief Williams, too, was a big part of organizing. So she did a great job. Thank you. And uh, many of the things can be found on the website. 
Um, I just want to give a round of applause to the ABCC for coming out. Um, it's a great turnout. I mean, I think the information was great. I think a lot of people got a lot of good information. But thank you, everybody. We adjourn. Thanks.